Hey everyone, my name is Yul Patel. I am a high school student and environmental advocate from Wilmington, North Carolina. In today's interview, we have Mr. Carson Wood, a wildlife biologist who specializes in the Southeastern United States' threatened and endangered species. He will be talking about environmental policy and endangered species. So Mr. Wood, thank you for your time today. Could you please tell us a little bit about yourself or the work you do? Uh, so again, I am a wildlife biologist. I represent Coastal Plain Conservation Group. We are a small 501c3 nonprofit based out of Wilmington. It's myself, my father, and my brother. Uh, we're a family affair. Uh, we founded CPCG to really work for two species of note for our region, the magnificent ram's horn snail that my father's been working with for uh, over 30 years now. Um, it's unfortunately most likely extinct in the wild um, in the lower Kafir region um, or throughout its range, which was the lower Kafir region, mainly due to saltwater intrusion uh, from enhanced dredging of the Kafir River to allow for the Panamax carriers to get cargo upstream because the Kafir River used to have a controlling depth of about 12 feet and now it's close to 60. Uh, so that's a lot more salt water coming in from offshore. Um, and then uh, for my aspect of it, I am um, kind of the voice for uh, red cockaded woodpeckers, which is a federally endangered bird species that is found in our region that has uh, a lot of protections afforded to it currently and unfortunately, there are some issues right now with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service proposing to downlist that species, which we'll get into that uh, as well. Um, but that is, is really the gist of what we do. We are here to um, kind of lobby for better protections for our native species, but also we are here for the human aspect of it because we all share this ecosystem and this eco region with a host of rare and imperiled species. Thank you, that was a really nice and detailed response. So now diving into our first question. Uh, so like just for the beginners, what what is environmental policy? So environmental policy is kind of a, a broad and, and encompassing uh, term. And it's one that you know, we, we could take a long time to really dive into the weeds of. But let's just say it is kind of the overarching theme of policy and regulation that has anything to do with the environment. So for example, the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, um, you know, these go to protect clean air, clean water. And then near and dear to me is the Endangered Species Act. That was um, ratified in 1973 to protect in endangered species based off of uh, some previous legislation from the 1960s as well. Um, but pretty much anything that involves the environment. So this could be you know, extractive industries from oil and mining as well. They have environmental regulations that they have to adhere to. Uh, so they also you know, deal with environmental policy, um, just a, a different set of them. So it's a very uh, broad series of policies and, and laws and regulations that kind of encompass that. And so it's hard to really say one specific aspect of it is environmental policy, kind of really at this point in time, everything relates to environmental policy. And as a wildlife biologist, how does your work incorporate environmental policy? So I look at environmental policy specifically for me, um, as I mentioned, the Endangered Species Act. That's where, pardon the pun, the rubber meets the road. Um, this is where the protections that are afforded to these federally listed species, um, that's where we find it. That's where we have uh, distinct definitions and architecture for how we go about protecting these species. Um, whether it be a federally threatened or a federally endangered species, because one is afforded more protection than the other or more um, not looseness in how it can be protected, but there, there's more flexibility in how um, certain actions can be uh, taken with threatened versus endangered species. Thank you so much for that response. 
Um, so like, how could an individual like uh, influence environmental policy or like engage in environmental policy? So as an individual, um, you know, there's a lot that we can do, but there's a lot that we can't do because um, there have actually been, as of late, uh, some of the actions that we can take as individuals to represent the, on behalf of endangered species have been stripped from us uh, in various uh, Supreme Court action or state action. So we don't have the same amount of power as a, an individual citizen to um, lobby for the protections of species. Now we really have to go about it through either major groups or figure out a, def a different action, whether it be from directly approaching representatives um, in local and state and federal government and, and trying to get meetings set up with them and say, hey, these are my concerns. You're not meeting them. What are we gonna do about that? Now, unfortunately, in a lot of that instance, uh, those representatives have people that have much larger donation capacity than you or I uh, for saying, hi, I can give you a billion dollars if you're willing to lobby or enact this legislation that I give you that will allow me to do X, Y, and Z extractive action or put in a massive uh, solar or wind farm in this particular area. Um, so you and I, as just a citizen, don't have the same clout as an individual like that. So there are a lot of nuances for how we can um, effectively uh, lobby and petition for environmental action. Thank you so much. So now moving on to endangered species, this is kind of a, a, a follow-up question. So how, what are endangered species? Like I know we've uh, talked about this with environmental policy, but just as a, another basic start to that topic. So I'm gonna cheat here a little bit and I'm going to quote directly from the Endangered Species Act. As it defines it, the term endangered species means any species which is in danger of extinction throughout all or a significant portion of its range other than a species of the class insecta determined by the secretary to constitute a pest whose protection under the provisions of this act would present overwhelming and overriding risk to man. Now, doesn't that sound lovely and technical? Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah. So all that says is that an endangered species is a species that has either a very limited uh, geographic range or a very limited number of species uh, representing it. So something that has a large geographic range but limited species, California condor. Uh, something that has a lot of numbers of individuals but a very small geographic range would be something like the Waccamaw um, darter or not or silver side. One of the two, <laughs> but a fish, think of a fish, something that you can have a lot of individuals um, but not a huge area where they're found. So they'd be really, um, you know, potentially impacted by one major event could wipe out the species. And that's the same thing that goes for the magnificent ramshorn snail that I was talking about earlier, and then the red cockaded woodpecker. We don't have a lot of um, red cockaded woodpeckers, but they have a fairly large range in the southeast, um, taking up um, from Virginia south to Florida and, and then west to Texas and Oklahoma. But they're fragmented throughout that range um, and kind of isolated in their own subpopulations. So they don't have the same resiliency that they did you know, 150, 200 years ago. Um, and then the same goes for Magnificent Ramshorn Snail. It had a very isolated geographic area that represented it. And probably a lot of individuals when it was first found in the 1900s or first described in the early 1900s. Uh, but now, you know, from uh, only a few actions, it's extinct in the wild. So that is what we face with endangered species is a couple of different threats. Uh, and since they are, this is just a follow-up question, since they are endangered in the wild, uh, could could it be possible to re, uh, to, put them back in their original habitat or would this not be possible for the majority of species that are extinct in the wild? 
So that's a very difficult question because let's just, again, let's look at the uh, magnificent ransomware and snail for, for a good example here. <clears throat> you have a species that has a very altered original ecosystem now. Um, for our area in particular, Greenfield Lake used to be home to magnificent ramshorn snail. Today, through runoff from pollution, development around it, and other pressures, that lake could no longer support ramshorns. Um, not to mention that there's another species of snail uh, that could potentially uh, interbreed with magnificent ramshorn snail. And um, then we'd essentially lose the species that way because it would no longer be genetically distinct. So there are a lot of challenges in doing these reintroductions, but they are possible. They just require a lot of funding um, in, in many cases. Uh, a good example of that that's actually being done currently is with the red wolf in Northeastern North Carolina. You have an area that historically had the species um, with a large geographic area uh, to reintroduce them into. But the issue that we had on top of that was with coyotes coming in and interbreeding with the red wolves that were reintroduced to that area. So you then lost that genetic lineage that you needed for that species to sustain itself. Uh, so that's, you know, there are a lot of challenges associated with reintroducing species that were extinct in the wild or were brought into captivity before they went extinct in the wild, much like California condor as well. And I know that since there are endangered species, another problem we have to look at are like the invasive species that are coming from overseas and uh, other places. So how do invasive species affect habitats and the resources for endangered species? This is a broad question. So like you can just give a specific example or something. Uh, so in our area in particular, we have a lot of threats from uh, invasive species. Um, and it's not just towards endangered species either. It's to whole ecosystems, um, which you lose the ecosystem, you lose everything that it supports. So a really good but unfortunate example that we have in our area is with a uh, disease that we're calling laurel wilt disease, which is a fungus that is cultured by a beetle that is a, a boring species that is just so, so tiny that the only way that you really know that it's there is when the trees begin to die. And it's, um, it's native from Southeast Asia, most likely came in the port of Savannah through um, lumber from pallets or packing crates, and it was just in there. And um, our natives don't have the ability to combat those fungal species um, that are attacking it. So the, it's attacking the red bay species, uh, Gordonia Bay, uh, Sassafras, uh, I think dogwood is a potential host for it. So some really charismatic species that a lot of us know and love. And dogwood's the state uh, flowering tree for North Carolina. Uh, so everybody knows dogwood and everybody, a lot of people know sassafras. And you know, these are important host species for some butterflies that are fairly common still. So we're losing kind of this capacity once again from these, in, from these invasive species. Um, so it's kind of similar to how we lost the uh, American chestnut through a blight uh, from a fungal blight as well. So these are the impacts that we have currently still. Um, you know, the, there are the there are too many invasive species to think about. We, we have a lot of aquatic plants that are, are noxious invasives in our area. Um, we don't have a lot of organisms um, that, that you know, we would consider that, we, not like the Northeast with the, the green crab up there um, or the zebra mussel in the Great Lakes. Um, you know, we, we have some carp, uh, some Asian carp that are introduced that are you know, competitors. And thankfully in North Carolina, we don't have a lot of those yet. Um, you go to Virginia, they have the, the snakehead fish, which is a you know, horrible invasive fish species that's really knocking out a lot of other animals um, that 
it's a hope, unfortunately, it's only a matter of time before it gets to North Carolina waters. So we have we have a lot of challenges, um, but you know, with with the right amount of management, we can hopefully combat those. And going off of management, what would be some potential forms of management for like aquatic and uh, terrestrial invasive species? So uh, particularly for the uh, terrestrial, say our plant species, a lot of our ports have uh, dedicated uh, USDA APHIS uh, teams that respond to looking at where you know, certain cargoes coming from in the world, if we know that they're, okay, there are some bases that we know that come from this particular region, we need to thoroughly screen and sanitize anything coming from that area. Um, a lot of, there are crop diseases that are even coming in that we have to be more aware of now just because of globalization. Um, but unfortunately the direct means of management, a lot of times for plants in particular, involves a host of, of nasty herbicides that have to be used to, to get rid of them. Uh, in terms of snakehead, that is you know, some exclusionary devices, but also just trying to call them as, as needed. And then for Asian carp, you know, they do the same thing. There are exclusionary devices and then they do carp roundups. Um, and I believe they even are trying to start doing some in North Carolina. So, you know, we have some tools at our disposal, but the, the biggest tool that we all need more of is, is funding um, <laughs> to, to really combat all of this. So that's, that's what it really comes down to is, do we have sufficient funding to combat um, invasive species? Well, that was a really nice response because funding does kind of seem to influence a lot of like the environmental work that we can do these days. Um, how do we as humans influence the endangerment of certain species going back to endangered species? So that is a huge existential question right there. <laughs> um, I don't know if we have enough time to really unpack that one, but there are a, a couple of big, um, large actions that are impacting endangered species right now. And particularly in the Southeast, it's from habitat conversion or habitat loss. And that's mostly associated with development um, or conversion for uh, monoculture plantation pines in, in the Southeast where we have you know, a need for paper product. Um, and that's, you know, that's a long-term, that's a legacy agricultural means, which there's nothing wrong with that, but there is something that needs to be done to ensure the survival of endangered species while providing you know some some capacity um for for business because you know one can't survive without the other unfortunately just because the nature of humans is to reproduce and there's more of us and there's more of us all the time so development is really the area that um, has a lot of room to improve in terms of impact to endangered species. Because right now you can go in, um, say I, I wanted to develop a plot of land that had an endangered plant on it. Well, unless I needed a permit or a, a, a federal permit to do something on that land, yeah, I could bulldoze it and be done. Um, because plants aren't afforded the same protections that say, a bird is um, like red cockaded woodpeckers. They they are afforded more protections through the Endangered Species Act. But I could also go in and say, well, this is causing economic jeopardy to me. Um, I can either get a habitat conservation plan or I can apply for what's called an incidental take permit to physically remove those birds from that property and hopefully have them reintroduced to another area where they will be protected. But we've seen in the past, a lot of times developers will just go out in the middle of the night and cut their trees down and call it a day. They may get fined, they may not. Um, one fine is $50,000 for the take of a cavity tree for an RCW. Um, and then it's $10,000 per tree uh, for their foraging habitat. But if you kind of spread that out over one mega development, say a development with, you know, 3,000 homes in it, 
that's a drop in the bucket for their overall cost of doing that development. They've they've taken away that that one little hit to their profit margin by selling a quarter acre lot or a tenth acre lot. So there's not a lot of teeth in development uh, regulation for endangered species because a lot of times it's really hard to get in front of it, um, uh, especially when you don't have um, state and local policymakers that are, are helpful in those issues because a lot of them have interest or financial backing from developers and, and realtors, um, unfortunately. We are the slim majority for representation in the environmental field. And a lot of times our issues aren't taken into account. So in like the Wilmington area, like there are like a lot of different habitats and regions where like species could live. Like what habitats do you think are like under the most jeopardy of like construction or like uh, development? So in particularly to the, let's just say Southeastern North Carolina. Okay. So we are home to, we, we are actually a biodiversity hotspot. We are globally known as an environmental or as a biodiversity hotspot. Um, NatureServe produced a map several years ago and then updated again, where it's kind of a heat map showing the, the US and regions that are, you know, higher number of species for diversity. And if you look at North Carolina, you have the mountains of North Carolina, and then you see this blip on the coast. That blip is Southeastern North Carolina. You know, we're home to the world famous Venus flytrap, um, but we're also home to some really obscure species, kind of like the magnificent ram's horn snail, and then uh, Greenfield ram's horn snail, which is even less common and potentially extinct, the wild species of snail uh, that we work with. But then you have red cockaded woodpeckers, and then you you have a whole suite of plant species. You know, we have plant biodiversity in southeast North Carolina that rivals Florida in the longleaf pine ecosystem in terms of diversity per square meter. And then we rival the tropical rainforest for plant diversity in one square meter. So we are a, a region that was once very rich in biodiversity. And New Hanover County in particular, it was once the most biodiverse county on the Eastern seaboard, north of Florida. And it might've been even so for Florida. So we are now in New Hanover County in particular, we're looking at less than 20% green space left, which is a, a joke to be quite honest, that we have gone from an area that was once cherished and you know, we hold the Venus flytrap in such esteem, but we won't stop the bulldozers. We won't do anything uh, but build, build, build. So we're losing capacity to support ourselves because we're in a region that's now facing a lot of different challenges, whether it be from sea level rise, climate change that's impacting our average weather patterns. Um, and then the development itself has caused flooding issues in our area that is completely altering how our hydrological cycle works because wetlands are filled in, uh, wetlands are bulldozed and destroyed, and you put homes over top of that. So you lose your storage capacity for that water. And I know that gets a little bit away from endangered species, but everything is tied together as, as it is. It is an ecosystem. Uh, one thing relies upon the other. And so in our area, what is under the most threat um, is really green space, having green space. And that also kind of ties into everything that we've gone through in the past few years with the pandemic is a lot of people need nature. We need to have somewhere to go outside. Uh, you know, th this is you know, something that's being prescribed even is time in nature now. And with our county having less than 20% green space left, you know, per citizen, it's not even an acre of, of area that a citizen can have because in the United County, I think it's close to 230,000 people now. Wow. And we have very few parks in our area um, as compared to 
other major metropolitan areas, even in North Carolina. Uh, Raleigh has the Umstead State Park, which is you know, several thousands of acres. We have Carolina Beach State Park, which is just shy of 700. Then Longleaf Park is you know, a couple tens of acres. And then we have a couple other sporadic areas. Um, but we do not have the uh, green space that we once did. You know, I, I can drive down the major thoroughfare in New Hanover County and, and in the city of Wilmington, you know, College Road and, um, and Market Street. And just in 20 years, what we've lost in those areas uh, from Habitat for Venus's flytrap, red cockaded woodpeckers, um, Carolina gopher frogs, maybe salamander, these, these obscure species that were you know, once called our, our county home are gone and they're gone forever, um, unfortunately. So the biggest thing that we, we face right now is that, is that challenge to preserving what we have left and kind of drawing a line in the sand and saying, enough, we, <laughs> we gotta have something left for uh, you know, the future generations because that's what we're losing is, is we're losing it for um, those future generations where our, our current leadership is not acting as good stewardship for, for the future. That's what it comes down to. Wow. So like the government and like Paul, our local county commissioners, like th there's not much that we can do now to like reverse the changes or is it coming to a point where like we might lose all of our green space? I don't want to be so pessimistic to think that we would lose all of it um, because you know they, they can't convert Carolina Beach State Park, thankfully. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's protected. Um, but there are there is a renewed push to develop an area in our county um, on Sidbury Road, um, which falls within Pender and New Hanover counties. But this area is known to um, a globally significant habitat type, um, and it's referred to as the Sidbury Savanna. It is this incredibly um, biodiverse area that has been now labeled as the last great chance for development in New Hanover County, even though it's home to Venus's flytrap. Um, and just a few short years ago, red cockaded woodpeckers were there, and they were just allowed to languish and disappear. And that has allowed for this renewed push for developing that area. Because now that the birds are gone, it's a lot easier to develop uh, when you don't have to take that into account. And, you know, fly traps, it's all well and good to talk about them. But, you know, until we have something that says, well, a bulldozer can't take it, rather than somebody who is incredibly poor goes out and digs one and sells it to a collector in any number part of the world gets you know these horrible fines enacted on them um, just because they are economically impoverished. But somebody with a two hundred thousand dollar bulldozer can go out and scrape the land and convert it into homes in one day. Um, that's the challenge that we face: is how do we balance this? need for development because we have a lot of people moving to our area um, but how do we balance it with our existing uh, biodiversity and how do we protect what we have left and to me it is the, the the trillion dollar question is how do we balance it so in terms of dealing with our local representatives um, I don't have a good answer uh, and into how to sway them um, to to see that we're only you know, taking from ourselves and taking from our future by um, reducing the capacity for adaptation to climate change and the flood events that we've now seen in several hurricane events in the past several years. We saw major flooding from those. So we're losing our capacity to bounce back from that. Uh, we're losing our resiliency. And I don't think that they see anything other than dollar signs when it comes to open land. 
Whereas, you know, hopefully most people would say, wow, those trees are really nice rather than those trees really offend me and I should cut them down. Yeah. <laughs> Cause that's, that's kind of how it seems at this point is either a uh, pine cone fell on somebody's head as a child and scarred them for the rest of their life. So now they have to cut down every tree they see, or I, I guess they just don't like oxygen. But, uh, but that's my, my simple take on it. I don't know. <laughs> so now um, going back to endangered species. So with like the limited green space and areas we have, our endangered species are obviously like, you know, in jeopardy. So like what work regarding endangered species do you see yourself doing in like the next, in the near future, like in the next couple of months, even a year or so? So the biggest thing that I'm hoping that um, CPC, CPCG can accomplish is a campaign and strategy for uh, figuring out how we fund land acquisition, because it's all well and good to get angry at somebody for saying, well, I'm going to develop my land because it's my land. And in, in the U.S., we have very, um, you know, total, total rights for how we can use our resources, uh, very individualistic. And so it's not really right of me to say, well, I don't think what you're doing is good and you shouldn't be able to do it. Yeah, it's, it's because I'm biased and I want to see those endangered species or that habitat preserved, but it is within their right to do that action unless they do actually have endangered species on their property and then they have to follow the rule of law. But if they don't or, or if they are encumbered by an endangered species, I think that it is the conservation community to figure out how to either purchase that land from them or get better incentives for them to uh, protect those species. Because right now, there's very little incentive to have an endangered species on your land. Um, it, it's, it's nearly a burden to, to have them, which is, which is unfair. And part of the reason why we've seen so much pushback against the Endangered Species Act since its inception uh, because it was uh, all stick and no carrot, as the old saying goes, um, that, you know, you have it, you're encumbered by it, but we're not going to really do much to help, you know, ease that burden for you to have that species. And that, that's not fair. Um, that's like saying, hey, you're going to carry around this 100 pound backpack all the time. And nobody else is going to carry it, but everybody else gets the same backpack. Well, that's not really that's not really fair um, to put that additional burden on somebody because you know some of this land could be you know family land that goes back for generations or um, in our area you know, you had a lot of timber sales but you also had a lot of uh, historical black communities that um, were given land um, or were able to purchase land early on and then to put that additional encumbrance on them without giving them an economic uh, buffer, whether it be from better uh, tax breaks for having them, um, that's really just what has to change. We, we have to change the dynamic of how people look at endangered species, because right now they're looked upon as somewhat of a negative by the common people, um, just because it's the federal government telling me what I can or cannot do with my property. And nobody really likes that. So what hopefully we're looking to achieve in the next six months is some really dynamic uh, public policy action or um, campaign to generate significant funds to um, acquire some, some major lands in our area just because it's, it's our last chance um, to, to do what needs to be done to protect what we have left. And if, if we lose, then we're losing um, our last great resource for climate mitigation, carbon sequestration um, in our area in particular. So we've got a lot of work ahead of us. Um, 
but I'm hoping we can really get some better community support, get some grassroots support for what we're trying to do. Um, my, my brother is a accomplished videographer and, and does some really incredible work on that end. So you'll be seeing more from him as part of CPCG. And then our actions in general will be really ramping up on, on what we're doing right now, just because it's kind of time of the V-essence. Um, we're, we're running out of it. And um, yeah, that's all we can do. So for the last question, this is kind of straying from like the entire environmental policy and endangered species topic, but is there anything, maybe some tips you want to tell the viewers about taking environmental action or like meaningfully getting involved in the community? Uh, so there are some really great things that we can do. Um, one, of, one of the ways that I, I like to kind of look at it is that how how willing are we to stand up for what we think is right for um, environmental protections? Like, are we willing to go to every county commissioner meeting, every um, um, city planning meeting, every board meeting, and just be a presence and to say, hey, I don't necessarily like what you're doing. And I, as a citizen, have the right to do that. And I think it's something that's unfortunately been lacking um, in our area in particular is the capacity for saying, hey, you're not doing what's best for us. You know, it seems like you can approve a car wash on one corner, approve another car wash on another corner, and then another one adjacent to it, but you won't fund a new school or you won't fund infrastructure improvement, or you'll fund infrastructure improvement to an area that really doesn't need it yet, but has a lot of green space there. So why are you doing it? And the, the biggest thing, the biggest aspect to me is just to speak truth to power and that we have to be a constant reminder that these representatives serve us. We don't serve them. We elect them into power. But I think a lot of people have kind of just allowed themselves to say, well, that's how it's going to be. Rather than saying, no, we can change that. And it just takes being active and a vocal presence to initiate that change. So that's really what it comes down to is that we've got to get active. We've got to get loud. We've got to be essentially in these people's faces and making them uncomfortable because that's when you get hard action occurring is when you make somebody uncomfortable. Like, why did you make that choice? Why did you sponsor that legislation? Do you, you know, really care about people's futures or do you just care about money? And that that's the hard questions that we have to ask and have to call into account. So that's really what it comes down to is getting, um, getting ourselves out there. And also a lot of these meetings local to our area um, are not held at favorable times for, for working adults to attend, either held in early morning sessions or mid afternoon sessions um, where someone like myself can't readily attend it. Um, so, we have to get that changed as well, as making our government more transparent and more open to the people. Uh, so that's that's what it comes down to. Well, thank you so much. Uh, you answered the questions really nicely and uh, even though they're so general and everything. So in concluding this interview, I'd like to thank again, Mr. Wood for his time and insight into this interview. Uh, please feel free to reach out to uh, him regarding his work and. Uh, see his work at CPCG. Uh, his contact information, if your if the your email is fine, will be linked in the description. Thank you.